Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, I'm often asked what to do with kids and how to foster or preserve their interest in science because we all know that kids are born scientists. What does a scientist do? Scientist explores their environment. They ask questions when they don't know something. Nothing ever stopped a kid from asking a question. Nothing ever stopped a kid from poking and probing and usually they end up breaking things and so much of our home environment is set up to prevent that. And so the question what should an adult do to foster scientific curiosity in kids, my real answer is to just simply get out of their way. They really don't need you to explore their environment. They're going to do that anyway. The real challenge in society today is not scientifically illiterate kids, it's scientifically illiterate adults. Adults far outnumber kids five to one in society. Adults wield resources, power, politics, uh, opportunity, money. So I'm really focused on adults. Uh, kids, you get those for free, provided you get out of their way. That's my lesson. Well, there are two variables there. One of them are people who may be anti-intellectual. Others, a subset of them, might be classed as anti-science. The, but the broader class of anti-intellectual, I actually blame intellectuals for that. There's the, the intelligentsia, those who are highly educated and have specific expertise. So many of them have sort of attitudes about that knowledge that distances them from others. Others who maybe care about what they're doing, but don't feel embraced by their thoughts or their attitudes or their approach to the material. So uh, I think part of, I think if a field wants their subject embraced by the public, it's not the job of the public to climb the mountain to reach them. It's their job to descend the mountain that they happen to be on and meet the rest of us. Uh, that's in my opinion as an educator and as a scientist. Uh, a lot of what I do is bringing my field to the public. And I don't get the, <clears throat> I don't get the sense, not at least in astrophysics, that people are rejecting it, especially since so much of what we know and do uh, matter to your survival. Is the asteroid headed our way? Is the climate going to change and flood your coastline? Is the sun polarity going to flip and how is that going to affect us? Is that solar flare going to take out the communication satellites? So I think the relevance of science can cure the sentiment in so many people that science doesn't matter to them or they choose to reject it. By the way, most of the people who are rejecting science are doing so while they're holding their cell phone in their hand, finding directions via GPS handed to them from a satellite launch from the space program, okay? Uh, so uh, some of it is just education. How much do you really understand? How much are you really aware of how much science has impacted your life? If you're not, uh, then we need to change that. Uh, otherwise, I think it, it, it comes. It comes. I think the resistance to science and knowledge is because people felt they didn't need it. And so some of the job of the educator is demonstrating to people that it's not only do they need it, it's fundamental to what it is to run modern society. And if we don't come to that realization, certainly other countries will and we'll just get left behind. Uh, well, sure, sure. And I think in the 1960s we didn't need an awareness campaign because the, the sheer attention the press gave to our voyage to the moon served as an awareness campaign because everyone knew it took frontline engineering and science to accomplish that. I kind of would like to see our country embark on another huge adventure such as that where the headlines write themselves and you don't need special programs to get people sensitized to the value of innovation in science and technology. And I essentially wrote a whole book on that, the Space Chronicles book is a call to reinvigorate people's uh, 
to, 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 re, to, to alert people, not only of the intellectual and emotional and even spiritual value to explore, but what, what value that then has on culture, economically, uh, how it in, impacts your security, particularly in modern times where security is not how many bombs do you have, but uh, have you thwarted the cyber attack or the biological attack or the chemical attack? You need scientists for that. You're not counting how many Marines you have on the front line when those are what challenges, when those are the, the security challenges of the 21st century. So when you have big, ambitious science goals as a nation, it can have the power to carry the rest of the nation with it. And that's kind of what I seek for our future. Without it, it's going to be a long haul. I love it. I, if it's there at all, I don't care how they portray it. I love it. Uh, take the Big Bang Theory, for example, the number one sitcom on television. It's a caricature of scientists and engineers. And some have, have, have criticized it for that. I like the fact that they try hard and succeed nearly all the time in getting the science banter correct. Right on down to the equations that are written on the, on the whiteboards in the classrooms in the, and in the hallways and in the bedrooms of uh, the residences of the main characters. Uh, I think anything that gets people talking about science is good. Take the recent film Gravity, for example. Uh, I had a series of tweets where I highlighted things that got wrong. I was shocked to find out how viral those tweets became, being reported in the next day's news and in blogs. And people said that, you know, you hated the film. I, no, I rather liked the film. But what it meant was for weeks after that, continuing even to this day, you have people arguing in bars over the science of a first-run film. And how often does that happen? Like, never. Never. I'd like to think it may have supplanted some of the conversation about Honey Boo Boo or, or you know, just look at some of the TV or some of the reality shows that capture so many people's attention. I'd like, to, I'd like knowing that science on some level can compete with people's attention in that regard. So it helped that there were two very attractive lead actors in the film. I don't know that it would have gotten so much attention if it didn't have high profile sort of A-listers uh, playing those roles. But uh, I'll take it. I'll take it. And there's enough places for people to go to get to correct the science that I, I'm good. Let's do more of it. Uh, the American defense budget has always been large. And so, and there was a lot of critique in the 1960s. Well, there were people who criticized the space program because it was getting, at the time, such a noticeable fraction of the federal budget, criticized that relative to how many schools you could build with that money, this sort of thing. Uh, what those criticisms didn't factor in is the impact that such an adventure has on your culture. Because when it influences your culture, you end up changing who and what you are as a nation, visibly and, and uh, so, for example, uh, and I don't have the time to detail it at this moment, but uh, in 1968, we first left Earth for the moon. It was Apollo 8. We went to the moon, didn't land, but we went to the moon and looked back and actually saw Earth for the first time. We went to the moon to discover the moon, but we actually discovered the Earth, sitting there in the sky with oceans and continents and clouds. And it didn't look like the schoolroom globe we had grown up with, with color-coded boundaries designating states and countries and continents. From 1968 through 1973 were, came major legislation regarding the environment. 1970, the Environmental Protection Agency was founded. Earth Day started. All of these things happen, and people say, oh, it just felt right. It just felt like it was the right time. Meanwhile, we're in a hot war 
in Southeast Asia, a Cold War with the Soviet Union, where the civil rights movement is still unfolding. Students are getting shot on college campuses. Yet somehow we found the time and the energy and the interest to take another look at Earth, to try to preserve our Earth. That's a cultural shift that doesn't happen if you don't set huge, huge, ambitious programs of discovery in front of you. And every time humans have explored, they've looked back and had a completely new perspective on where they came from and where they're headed and where they are. Space can do that now in ways that the old explorers, where those exploratory journeys did for the cultures that sponsored those trips back in the 16th century. So uh, I think we, we can choose to not explore and we'll fade. We'll just be business as usual from day to day. And it's not a matter of, well, we can't afford this. Or you, the, going to the moon was the least affordable thing in the 1960s. But we found the will to do so. By the way, it was military. We, we were racing the Russians. They're our sworn enemy. If we go back into space, I, I, I don't want it to be military. I would understand it if it were, but you could do it and be driven by economic forces. If you innovate on the frontier of science and technology and engineering and math, you are, you are sowing the seeds of tomorrow's innovation, of tomorrow's economic industries. You are guaranteeing your presence in the 21st century economy. Those countries that don't will just sort of dance to the tune played by other nations. And I fear that we're fading rapidly in that direction. Yeah, I actually, I interviewed Temple Grandin for my radio show, uh, Star Talk Radio. We actually, I don't think we've posted it yet. It's still in our, in our, in our files ready to, to emerge. Uh, but uh, her big message is that not everyone thinks the same way. And if people think differently, there are certainly ways and reasons to tap the different ways people do think because they can contribute materially to our understanding of the world. And, and both Temple Grandin and Einstein have contributed materially yeah. to our understanding of the world. So it's a matter of does the educational system spot and, um, and tap all that each student can offer. And if people are educated en masse, then that makes it much harder because everyone goes through a cookie cutter and the system only homogenizes you rather than finds out um, what key fits who and what you are to find out how you can best contribute to society. So I, I think our education system has a long way to go. And I'd like to think that Temple Grandin, Grandin's books have sensitized educators to this. That sort of property in a person's uh, interpersonal uh, skills is, is highly represented in my field. I, I, I don't know if it's as high as 10%, but it's certainly high enough so that when someone, when I finally first read the diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome, I said, wait a minute, that's like Joey and that's Susie and that's, there's like all these people I knew in my field and uh, fortunately there's still plenty of ways people can contribute their intellect in this regard. Mm -hmm. A, a new religion. Um, well, as long as our definition of religion includes praising divine beings that have supernatural powers, uh, the answer is no. Uh, if you, because science is the opposite of that. Um, science, uh, we find sort of laws of nature, but they're open for testing, and they, if we can find a better law that's more encompassing, we'll do that. And uh, so if you change the definition of religion to be that which a lot of people sort of agree with and do, then I, I suppose so. But by any normal definition of the word religion, um, science 
uh, seeks evidence in support of what it does. And it can find evidence that refutes what it does. And that's not the conduct of the history of religion. So uh, there's n no way they are the same activities. 